Today's sponsor is The Optimist, one of my favorite places to shop for men's clothes. You can get a discount if you said I sent you. When you go to The Optimist, the store feels like you're hanging out in someone's living room with your friends. The discount code is Danny. 20 for a 20% discount. You could also go into their store at the platform in Culver City or their pop up on Beverly Drive in Beverly Hills. Otherwise, go online to The Optimist and uh, you get 20% off some of the coolest curated clothes from all over the planet. These guys get the hippest the hippest stuff and the best quality at the best prices. So the new Beverly Hills pop up store is open in January at 352 North Beverly Drive. Both shops are open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily. You can always go to the website at theoptimistla.com or find them on Instagram at theoptimist underscore LA. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Deal. Today's guest, Mark Peeper, CEO of ISE Baseball. Based out of Chicago, he's represented Justin Verlander, uh, Mariana Rivera, David Ortiz, on and on. Uh, Huge, huge, long-standing career in sports. So we're going to get into his story, how he got into it, and uh, you know what the status of the professional baseball is today, how arbitration works, what's going to happen with spring training with COVID. Uh, you can always find Mark at Mark Peeper on Instagram or at isesports.com. You can find their firm there. Uh, please, please subscribe and leave us a comment. Our rankings are going up and everyone counts. So please tell someone you know to tune in and uh, check this out with Mark Peeper. It's, it's an amazing discussion. School is in session. Welcome to The Deal. Today I got my boy all the way from Chicago, Mark Peeper, the CEO of ISE Sports Baseball. What's up, peeps? How you doing, brother? How we doing, DB? I'm doing good. I've certainly got to be sitting in better weather than you. What's the weather like out there in Chicago these days? Well, I'm looking out my window and it's a little uh, gray, a little dreary, a little cold, but that's what we get in January in Chicago. We're used to it. Bill's care. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are you uh, working on some late night deals for Verlander and uh, Big Poppy? You getting Big Poppy out of retirement? Rivera, <laughs> tell me what's going on at the office these days. Yeah, well, those two guys are taken care of, um, and, and <laughs> Justin is uh, recovering from an injury. But yeah, right, I'm, in the, I'm in the office working on an arbitration trial. So I don't know how many people know the sports well enough and know how the contracts are decided. But in baseball, we have this process by which certain guys can have their contracts decided basically by a neutral panel of judges um, yep. arbitration. So there's a panel of three judges. You put on a case on behalf of your player. The team puts on their case. And ultimately, the uh, the, the judges decide which one is right and or wrong. Um, and so I'm working on Mike Soroka's right now for the Braves. Awesome. Well, let's stop with that right there because that is such an interesting part of professional sports business that uh, unless you're really into it, you don't know. Kind of give us a little more in depth about the arbitration process and a typical situation. You don't have to use names or numbers, but so let's talk. Uh, you know, let me just throw out a name: uh, Corey Seager, yeah. you know, for instance, or Bellinger. I know he just kind of went through. So, tell me how. Let's give it a, a sort of a template of how how arbitration really works. So, a young guy like like Bellinger signs his initial contract, and it's a couple years. Walk yeah, so, us up to the arbitration and how it how it happens. Okay, so let's you move past the the draft bonus, right? Now they go through the minor league system, they get up to the big leagues. For the yeah. first three years of them being in the major leagues, basically they're under control of the team so long as the team pays them the minimum salary, which is five hundred thousand yeah. dollars, right? Once you get three years of service, generally speaking, there's a little exception in there, but once you get three years of service, you still the team still controls you. Right. So that you can't go anywhere. You're not a free agent, but you have the right. If you don't agree with the team on what your salary should be, you have the right to have it determined by a neutral panel of salary arbitration judges. Right. There's three judges. So let's say, for example, I'm negotiating a contract for any one of the guys that you mentioned. Um, they're up for arbitration. Basically, let's say that we think the right salary for the player is three million dollars. OK. And the team says, now nah, we don't think so. We think it's $2 million. Well, there's kind of a marketplace within each class. So if you have three years of service, there's kind of a marketplace within all the players that came before you that had three years of service 
that look like you. So you're never going to compare Bellinger to Soroka because one's a hitter, one's a pitcher. You're comparing yeah. Mike Soroka to pitchers that have come before him. You're comparing sure. Justin Verlander or Clayton Kershaw to other superstars like that when they come through the system. And within that, you find the the group of guys and the teams always find the group of guys that the player looks like that can pay the most from the least amount. Right. And we find the guys that the player looks like that ultimately demands the highest salary. Got it. And the hope is that you negotiate to a, a middle ground or negotiate something that makes sense for both parties. So, or that the marketplace is so defined that you don't really have to argue over it that much. But in some cases you can't decide on what is right and you, can, yeah. you just can't come to a middle ground. So you literally walk into a room this year. We're going to do this on Zoom for the first time ever because of wow. but you, Zoom arbitration. <laughs> and you basically try the case. I mean, it's like being uh, it's our version of being a litigator. And you argue your case with the player sitting right there um, and you go you talk as a player for an hour and then the team talks for an hour. And then you break and then you come back for rebuttal, which is basically about a half hour each. And at the end of the day, the judges decide either your number or their number. No Got it. settlement in between. It's black and white. It's we yeah. want two, we want three. And yeah. who are the three judges? What are they? Ex players, ex executives? Ex, what, who are no, they? they're 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 arbitrators certified by. Uh, an association of arbitrators that have years of doing this. I mean, they got it. So they're professional settled, arbitrators. Yeah, they may settle cases in like the steel industry or workers' compensation issues or whatever. It just so happens. Real estate disclosure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it just so happens that they qualify to do salary yeah. in baseball. So they have some at least understanding of the statistics um, and how baseball players are paid to kind of qualify. And the Players Association and MLB work together to, to pick these groups. That's a great explanation. So once you get past that three-year mark, does arbitration continue to come up when your next contract's up? Is that always no. a tool or is that only the first big contract? It's only the first three. It's only those three years, three years, four That's years, it. years of service time. And then once you get to six years of service time, you're an unrestricted free agent. It's not like the other sports you go and, you know, you basically go to the bitter, yeah. or, or the team that you really want to. And that's the things that you're reading about now. You this free agent signed here, this awesome. free agent there. Those are guys that, for the most part, have accumulated six years of service. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, look, you've done deals and represented some of the biggest to ever play. Verlander, hopefully Verlander, for our sake and the Dodgers' sake, doesn't come back 100% or 110%. I know for your sake, you're hoping he comes back better. Uh, but, you know, you've represented Verlander, one of the best yeah. ever. Big Poppy, arguably one of the best ever. Mariano Rivera, one of the best ever. I mean, many of these people that you've worked with through the years have been, could arguably be called the best player at their position of all time, or certainly one of the top five or ten, basically in the elite class. So before we get into all that, uh, and get into how interesting and stressful that must all be. I'd love to get into your beginnings. I know you grew up in the Midwest in Chicago. Can you just kind of break us down to where you grew up, how you grew up, where you went to high school, how, where you went to college, how you went to Michigan, uh, Wolverines, yeah. Uh, yeah, but baby. go blue. Could walk me through Mark Peeper's The Beginnings and how you okay. got into the sports world. Yeah, so I, you know, I played sports growing up. I grew up, I was born in Chicago Heights, Illinois. So South side, South suburbs of, um, South side. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you know, and then I actually moved to a town called Madison, Matt, um, M A T T E S O N, which is really like just right next to Chicago Heights. I went to a school, high school called rich South. And you know, I, I took school very seriously. I love sports. My whole family played sports. Um, I played, football all through high school. I played baseball through high school. I played basketball for a piece of, of high school. And then when I was deciding on what schools to go to, and I got into Michigan and decided to go to Michigan, I think my hopes of playing college baseball, football, or basketball or anything was pretty much eliminated. So I went to University of Michigan. My family is not like, it's not like there's a whole history of University of Michigan people or Ivy League. It's a very blue collar okay. working. My dad was a cabinet maker. My mom was a secretary. It's a very blue collar mechanics and carpenters and cabinet makers type of family. Um, okay. When I went to Michigan, it was a little bit of a, you know, unusual experience, at least from my family and the history of my family, because there it was, you know, not, it was a very expensive school from, from our standards. 
um, high, high academic school. So I, I to be, if I'm br- being brutally honest, a little bit of a fish out of water when I first got yeah. there. I mean, I was, I, I was excited to be there. I loved it, but nobody from my high school was going there with me. I was like a lot of people go to college with people they know. And like, that wasn't an option for me. So when I got there, I really didn't know anybody. Uh, I knew one person uh, and a kid that I went to junior high with. And I never visited the school one time before I excited to go there. So my first going up there, I knew, I mean, literally, I'll tell you the story because it's at least an interesting story of how I decided. I had very little direction in terms of this experience because it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't like a lot of family history. A kid that I went to junior high with was a really, really smart student, but we were in different like zones of our hometown. So he went to a different high school. I kind of stayed friends with him, but he was a really smart kid, smart kid that I went to junior high with. His dad was my dentist. So I just happened to go to the dentist one day. He asked me about applying for schools. I kind of told him who I thought I was going to apply to. He said, have you ever thought about the University of Michigan? I was like, I don't know anything about it other than it's at Michigan. I know their sports. And he said, that's where my son is applying. You should call him and you should talk to him about it. So I was like, okay. So I called him, reconnected with him. He said, yeah, that's my top choice. You should apply. And I was like, okay. I applied, knowing nothing about it, not visiting, not asking anybody. I got in, luckily, which I've heard. I mean, I guess it was tough back then, but I've heard it's really, really tough now. Um, And I called him and I said, hey, I get in. Did you? And he said, yeah. Do you want to go? And I said, yeah. I have to actually get my parents to take out ungodly amounts of loans and everything for me to go there. But as long as I get that approval, sure, I'll go there. And that was basically how I decided on Michigan. Wow. <laughs> Based on the fact that I happened to go to a dentist and the dentist kid wanted to go to Michigan. I like their uniform, so I'm just going to go there. I like their helmets. I like their uniform. <laughs> That's unbelievable. And, and the amazing thing is, not knowing nothing going into it, those are my best friends in life. That's how I met my wife. Like It opened up all these doors for the remainder of my life that still apply today. And it was almost pure luck that I went there. Yeah, well, that's an interesting theme because here you are, a blue-collar kid, and going to a big university where there's a lot of kids from wealthy families and upper-middle-class families. You're a fish out of water. No one's been to a big university. A lot of people can't compete in that kind of environment. So you had to go into a new environment, totally uncomfortable, make your way, and that just says a lot about you uh, you know, as, as an individual and a character. And also, you went in there not knowing anybody, and you came out of there like the mayor of Michigan, where, like you said, a lot of your best friends and uh, a lot of close relationships uh, from that. It's just a really interesting, really interesting uh, piece of history to, to, to learn. So yeah, thank I don't you know if I've ever that. told that story before, but that's truly how I got there. Um, and, yeah. you know, I loved it, but at the very beginning, like my freshman year, if I'm being really, really honest with myself and, and, and everybody that talks to me about this, I did feel like I had to kind of navigate my way through because, you know, a lot of the friends that I met at the very beginning, they were like, hey, we're going out to dinner here. or Hey, we're going to this concert. Or we're going. I, said, I couldn't go to any of those places. I didn't have the kind of money for that. Um, yeah. I had to kind of figure this out. But it's just a matter of then meeting the right people. And then I met as a freshman, you know, someone who I became really, really close friends with um, who grew up on the north side. But she became like my, my best friend as a freshman. We really hit it off and truly just as best friends. And, and then, you know, we ended up getting married and here we are 30 years later. Um, but that made the transition to Michigan. That's a lot little, better. little half peeps, AKA exactly. Dana, Peeper. Dana Send peeps. my love to Dana. Yeah. Um, the best. So she She's grew up, she grew up in a very different way in some ways, but also just very other different. side of the tracks. Other yeah. She was on the north side. I was on the south side and that's kind of what bonded us together. But she was also very, just like, you know, pretty conservative and, and, um, was just really easy to talk to. And it was, that's kind of how I used her to kind of help navigate myself in this experience. And then, that, and that was it. And we did, we were just friends as freshmen. And then as sophomores, we started dating and then have, you know, are still together to this day. That was 19. The, the rest is history. So you guys started later. dating sophomore year of college. Yeah. Well, at the very end of freshman year, basically. And then amazing uh, summer, like, so it was, um, I don't know, I guess in 1990s when we first started dating. Well, that's a whole podcast in itself, Dana, right. the triplets. Uh, we'll get yeah. into that. So, yeah. so now you're you're at Michigan. 
now you're working your way through getting ready to graduate. I know you went to law school. So what, you know, a kid that was borrowing money, blue collar background, just to go to a prestigious school like Michigan. Now it sounds like you're taking it to the another level or multiple levels to go to law school. How did that come into play? And how did you make your way through law school coming from your background? Yeah. So, so when I got out of Michigan, I actually started a, a consulting job and I was always interested in law, but I honestly is like, there's no way I can add on to the debt that I already have. Like, how am I going to afford going to, to law school? So I started working for a while um, at a consulting job and I was doing well and I, I enjoyed it, but I, that's not what I, I could, I could tell that's not what I wanted to be the rest of my life. Um, sure. And I had this kind of interest in, um, in sports law and what that would mean. And of course, when you think of sports law, one of the first things you think of is an agent, right? Well, yeah. knew one agent, he was one of the most successful agents. He had been uh, an agent since, since 1976. And it was my wife's, well, now my now wife's father. My That's good. That's a good person to know. <laughs> Although at the time that I was going through all this, I didn't know he was going to be my father-in-law, but I started talking to him about it. Um, and he was really, really successful. I mean, he started one of the most successful practices back in 1976, representing a bunch of Cubs and White Sox. And then it just blew up into a very, very successful business. Yeah. Um, and that's who kind of guided me through. So part of what, how I got into this business was having a good resume, but really it was who I knew. Um, yeah. You had a key relationship in yeah, doing exactly. exactly what you wanted to do. Yeah. And, and I, I didn't want to compete. If I wanted to get into this thing, I didn't want to compete with him. So he only did baseball. So I met this guy who was looking to be a football agent and he and I kind of hit it off and we started talking and basically we just decided, let's just try it. It was me and this other guy going out there trying to get NFL clients. Um, and two things happened. One, I got my brains beat in. Um, yes. But- <laughs> I, I got some clients. Now they weren't big, high-profile guys, late-round draft picks. Um, I really focused initially on offensive linemen, under the notion that, like, okay, it's less sexy, less people yeah. going after, less competitive. I watch hours of lineman film. Awesome. Like literally, just watching the. If you ever seen a football game and the <laughs> only focuses on linemen. Good hands. You got to have good hands. Good <laughs> feet and good hands. Yeah. So I would watch their footwork. I watched them and I focused primarily on the big 10 because it was closer in driving distance. And that's why well, you got some good linemen there. I mean, that's yes. cream and of the crop. Line. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got NFL linemen uh, on every team in the big 10. That's right. So, so that's, so that's what I focused on at the very beginning. Got a couple clients and there's two things that I realized is one that I'm not sure that I want to stay in football because I really was, intrigued by the arbitration process, which only existed in hockey and baseball. Um, and two, I was convinced I needed my law degree. So that's when I decided I'm just going to go on more debt and apply to law school. And I went back to law school and Got it. Uh, went to Northwestern Law School. And that was when I started like, okay, I'm just here to be a sports agent. That's my whole goal. Now, how many years out of undergrad was it? I didn't realize that you had a gap of where you were working before law. Three years, so I think. A couple of years. Got yeah. It. So three you were years. in the working world for a couple of years, yeah. got laser focused, had the relationship with Dana's dad. I'm like, this is what I want to do. Now I'm doubling down. I'm going to go more in debt, go to law school. You get into a prestigious law school, Northwestern. And when you're going to school there, are you juggling? Are you working as a sports agent and going through yeah. law school? Yep. Yeah. In fact, while I was a consultant, I landed a couple NFL clients. So I was a consultant and it was like, I wasn't high up in that company. So I had to have this agreement with my secretary is like, if someone calls for me and says they're from the New York, <laughs> there's no cell phones back then. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Right. So I was like, you have to like, just don't say anything, pass on the cl- the call, you know, yeah. at this arrangement, she was the only one that knew I was trying to do this. Um, and so I was doing that. And then when I went to law school, he's in a client, he's in a client meeting in the conference room. Uh, he'll call me back in an hour. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was insane, man. Dude. So that, that's what I was trying to do. I was leading this double life as an NFL agent while I was working in this consulting practice. And then when I went to law school, we finally got cell phones. Um, but I was still like, you know, I would take a call from a client and then walk into this moot court trial with my peers. And they had no idea that this, I was leading that double life either. 
I had a small number of clients, so it wasn't overwhelming. And I was really just trying to learn the business. Did I like it? Did it was I would I think I would be good at it? And once I have my law degree, can I really do something with this? Um, and that was really what the test was. Am I, is this something that I really, really want to pour myself into? Yeah, and what an incredible time management circus if you're in law school, let alone just the demands of law school. Now you're the demands of being a young sports agent, you're juggling both of those. It just reminds me of a funny story. Matt Hannaford, who I know you know from your yeah. business, he was telling me the story of when he started working at Beverly Hills Sports Council. He was in, a, in undergrad in Long Beach, and he was getting calls from Mike Piazza at his class. And his professor was like, what are you doing taking a call? And he showed him the phone, and it said Mike Piazza. The professor was like, oh, I got it. And then from that point on, he had a, the professor was like, oh, if that's what you're doing, I'll leave you alone. You're doing yeah. real business. So that, that's, that's so funny that you're living the double life, doing both. And were you doing baseball at that point or still football? In, so in mostly football at that time. And then yeah. I, by the time I got into maybe my second year of law school, I actually started working at the company. My, and so there's like these parallel paths that were going on. My father in law yeah. was really successful, was kind of looking at, all right, what's the next phase within my own company? They were, you know, extremely successful. And it, he wasn't going to do that forever. Um, so he was kind of looking at, well, what's the, you know, how is this going to work? Who's going to handle what? And they were looking for like a young arbitration attorney. Well, I was fascinated with arbitration. I wrote my, what we call third year thesis at Northwestern on baseball salary arbitration, which means you can pick your own topic. You have a professor that you sponsors you and you wrote it. So I was kind of fascinated by the whole thing. And he knew that he knew I was in law school. And I think his logic was this guy kind of fits the profile of what we're looking for. The fact that he may become my son-in-law, I got to have to put that aside. Um, yeah. I'm not going to do this forever. And this could be a chance. Were you married at that point? no, no, we got Were you engaged at that point. Um, I think when, right, yeah, I think probably got engaged. You know, my, my wife and I dated for 10 years before we got married. Right. That's true. So it's like you were yeah, already so we were in, common we were in law plan, common law marriage. So he's yeah. got to hire his son in law to be. So that's a whole nother, a whole nother like world of complexities and conflicts yeah. and, you know, layers yeah. of. You know, you're, it's not just your boss. Now it's your father-in-law and it's your daughter and it's taking work home. And it's, you know, the, my fucking boss, I'm so stressed out. And it's like, well, now that's your father-in-law. And it's like, oh, we, I can't imagine. Talk, talk to me a little bit about that because that's, that's a very unique experience. I mean, how do you juggle family life and business life? It's being in business with your family. Yeah, so I never thought, in fact, part of the reason why I went into the NFL and never even touched baseball at the beginning was for that for that very matter. For that reason. Yeah. To, to ask him for a job. I never wanted to um, to ever have him in that situation. The, the one thing I say, as much as on paper the situation seems like it could be a complete nightmare, he's this phenomenal human being that just wants the best for people, especially his family. So he, he just poured all his energy into teaching me the business the right way and gave me a ton of responsibilities. And I say this all the time. I think I learned in the first year what it takes people three, four, five years to learn because I could be on family vacations with him and be able to pick his brain. Like I had constant access to somebody who had been very, very successful and who was willing and wanted to teach me and wanted me to be good at this. And he didn't stay in it long after I started full time after law school, he he and I didn't work. I think maybe there was only like a one year overlap. Oh, you mean he retired? Yeah. Oh wow, so that's ideal. So you had you had ideal timing where the sense where he wasn't like at his peak anymore. He was ready to to move on. And it sounds like he's just the type of person that has no ego and isn't trying to compete and show you up. He had the other. He was the other side of the spectrum where he's trying to build you up and mentor you and you get a PhD in professional sports, you know, yep. working with them. So that, that's an awesome yeah. experience. Not, I mean, not he, everyone has that. No. And he's become, even as he is retired, um, you know, and stays, you know, from a distance stays involved in a lot of his older you know, former clients and still has relationships everywhere. I mean, he's become a friend, a mentor, you know, somebody I can just talk about. And the, and the thing is, the reality is the business has changed so dramatically from the time that he was in it 
that if, if, if he sees what this is, I'm not sure he would want to be in the business. Yeah. Um, is now he was kind of you know some of that stuff was starting when he was getting out of it it's gone sure. in, in a degree where he probably was like I'm, i probably got out at the right time for who he is as yeah. a person yeah but what a unique special relationship for you to have that person have that resource that's incredible so all yeah. right so now you get into the baseball uh he he retires you're now on your own doing your thing yeah. talk me through who when was like your first yes i got a big client moment when who was that client where you're like wow I, I've gotten to this level now where I've gotten an all-star or I've gotten a young superstar or first round draft pick. When did that happen and who, what was that like? Yeah. I mean, certainly, um, you know, like I think some of my big clients early on were like Verlander and Morneau. One of my favorite, favorite clients and favorite stories is um, I was, you remember at the time, the information that we had available to in terms of who was good and who wasn't is not the, what it was today. Everybody knows everybody, everything about every player now, right? Yeah, yeah. They sent me out, when I say they as my company, sent me out to, I think I want to say low A, North Carolina, to watch a pitcher on the Colorado yeah. Right? Love it. I'm maybe Asheville, North Carolina, possibly at the time. Asheville, so, North Carolina. Love it. Yeah. So I'm out there watching this left-handed pitcher, um, and reporting back to, you know, to everybody as to what I saw. And I basically called back to the office and they said, you know, what do you think? And I said, like, he's pretty good. Um, you know, remember I, I am not a professional scout by any means. I was at the same time trusting my gut, but at the same, but also doubting myself a little bit, you know, yeah, yeah. because, and so, but the good news is we had a bunch of relationships within front offices and people for the Rockies that we could just call and say, Hey, what's your opinion on this guy? At that time, not everybody had agents. Unlike now everybody has an agent. Yeah. But when I was watching the pitcher, there was a guy patrolling center field who I just fell in love with. And he was just all over the field. He was diving for balls, running the bases, just like when you watch him. And I love speed too. I was kind of partial t- towards people that could run. Um, so I said, He's pretty good, but when you call the Rockies, ask him about their center fielder because I kind of like him more. And so they, my <laughs> bosses called the Rockies and said, hey, what do you think, what do you have on these two guys? Um, and they gave reports and they said, the kid in center field is a late round pick, but we really do like him. He's he's an unbelievably hard worker. Um, he's, you know, he doesn't have a lot of power, but, you know, he's extremely, extremely dedicated to this. You know, we can't tell you what he's going to become, but I understand why you like him. So I told, I said to my bosses at the time, one of them was my father-in-law. I was like, I'd really like to take the center fielder out. And he's like, well, go for it. At some point, part of this is trusting your instincts. So I instead approached the center fielder, asked him for breakfast. At the time, he didn't have an agent. He said, yes. Um, And that's Juan Pierre, who played Ah, a a long time. And one of my favorite friends, people I've ever met, favorite players, just there's so much unique about him. And it all started from, that was my first like gut instinct of, I want to take a chance on this guy. I don't really know if I even know what I'm doing really, but I believe in, I believe in this guy. And the good news is I knew that once I got a player and I was their agent, I had, you know, a whole slew of support behind me uh, people that could teach me how to do this to make sure I knew exactly what I was doing. And I had experience of being on my own in football. So I wasn't, yeah. I had confidence in my ability to navigate through the CBA and that it was just a question of whether or not I trusted myself enough to pick who was going to be good major league players. Um, and and that how was, many years from that point before he got called up? Very yeah, obviously quickly. He, was, he moved through the system quickly. Um, yeah. It was less than two years. I think he was in the big leagues. Wow. And he was a low draft pick. Again, for people that don't know baseball specifically, the odds of going through the minor league system when you're not a top draft pick, it's like almost impossible. You know, it's, yeah. it's very, very rare to get the looks and the reps. Uh, so that's incredible. What a great guy he is. Yes, I've met him through you. Yes. <laughs> when he yeah. was playing he, for the Dodgers. Great uh, unbelievable. Like one of my favorite human beings. He will always be one of my favorite human beings for the rest of my life. Um, just an unbelievable person, unbelievable dad, unbelievable. Shout team. out to JP Juan Pierre. Haven't talked to him in a while. Say hello. Said my best. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he had that and sweet place in the marina. Remember, he had that yes, sweet exactly. ocean view pad in the marina. Right. He, he, 
You did some work for JP back in the day. Yeah, you? I did. I did. I did. Yeah. So lots of good ones. So let's walk us through now that as you're establishing your book of business, what are some of the other bigger players? Big Poppy. When did you connect with Big Poppy? So big. So because the way our one of my company, favorites of all time. I know the way our company works is that we have, you know, remember I was coming into an already established agency. So we had a lot of people with a lot more experience than me. Some people with the same amount of experience. So Big Poppy is somebody that one of my coworkers had since the time he was young. In fact, when he was, I want to say his name was David Arias when he first came through. It wasn't always David yeah. Ortiz, a different first name. Yeah. Someone's got to do some research on that, but I think it's David yeah. Arias' first name. We'll do a uh, fact check on that, Ray. <laughs> yeah, make sure. Make sure I know what I'm talking about. So, well, one I mean, my- David Ortiz is a phenomenal story. We'll get into the oh whole my God. story of, you know. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Now known as one of the greatest players of all time, clutch players of all time. But, I mean, he was not that well-known unless right. he really knew baseball. But, anyway, we'll, yeah, we'll get I, into I, that after this. I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, he was non-tendered by the Twins. And what that means is basically yeah. Twins set him free for nothing. Um, for nothing. Signs with the, with the Red Sox and Red the rest. Sox. So, he was handled by, and always was, one of my coworkers um, who still works okay. here. And so, for Ortiz my responsibility was really more on like the arbitration side. So when he was going through arbitration, I was the one that was presenting his case, preparing his case. Um, so a lot of my experience with him was really just in preparation. Of his, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and like when we, in fact, he went to, he went to the very doorsteps of a trial, meaning we were prepared, did the whole, wrote the whole case, had our suits on the morning of walking into the hearing and got into a conversation with the Red Sox front office that turned into a negotiation and we end up settling before we end up going to trial. Um, right there. But, but yeah, so that's my, my work. So my work with everybody, sometimes it's a guy that I have like a Juan Pierre, Justin Verlander, or Justin Morneau, where I do, a, a, you know, almost everything. And in other cases, I'm a, you know, co-negotiator. And in some cases I'm the arbitration guy. And in some cases I'm just like the CEO that overlooks all the work that other people are doing. Yeah. Um, a couple of things I want to stop and rewind and you know we'll get more into David Ortiz because it kind of cuts into the theme of what we talk about on this show in terms of what it takes to succeed at the highest level and the persistence and the work ethic and certainly hearing your story and getting through college and law school it clear the work ethic and the discipline and the structure you had all that you wouldn't have been able to navigate all that but getting into using these players like Juan Pierre you said what a great great learning lesson for young athletes, but young people in general. You were there to scout some high prospect, a pitcher, and a young center fielder who's unknown stands out because he's hustling and playing hard. And that just shows you, like, for young people, especially in sports, but in anything, like, you never know who's watching. You never know when your opportunity is going to become. So hustling and playing 110% effort at all times, full speed, is huge. And with young athletes, you know, we say this all the time, and so many of them, because they watch the superstars and they watch the Puigs and they want it, and that's all great and fun and entertaining, but when you're grinding and you're trying to make it, man, you got to be playing 110% at all times, because look at Juan Pierre there, that's where you discovered Juan Pierre, and a couple of years later, he's a major leaguer and a career all-star, you know, so an incredible story. And I, I want to kind of turn this into the David Ortiz now, because and you can speak more to it, but David Ortiz uh, was always a solid player, uh, always a solid hitter, but he was not a superstar at all, was not an all-star with the Twins. The Twins let him go. Uh, you know, So what do you make of that for someone like David Ortiz and his mindset, being a professional and having all those years in the, the twin system, never, be, never being treated like a superstar, then he pivots, gets picked up by Boston, and he goes on a tear. I mean, the mindset to have the confidence, the mindset, the work ethic. Can you sort of speak to that, to that transition, the David Ortiz transition from regular player to superstar and what that, what kind of, what that tells you about him and his work ethic and what he had to go through? Yeah. So I would say that the, the lesson of a lot of this is there are some players who are just purely so talented that no matter what situation they're in, what team drafts them, what round they get picked in or whatever, they're just so talented. They're going to make it no matter what. A-Rod. Circumstances, right? Trout. And there are some players 
that unfortunately the other way, right? No matter how many opportunities they get, they're just not quite good enough. But there's a whole bunch of guys in the middle and it comes down to they have the talent, but can the other things line up properly? Do they get the right opportunity at the right time? Are they working their butt off? Are they trying to improve? And baseball, as everybody should know, if you're a baseball fan, it is not a straight line at all. There are ups and downs to everybody's career. It is a, a grueling, grueling sport mentally. And you could have it figured out on a Monday and then on Friday go up there to the plate and, and it feels like you've never hit a ball before in your life and that you're struggling to make contact. It, it's yep. that type of sport. So the key is to never really, really get too up during the ups and never get too down during the down level. Keep putting, right. Keep putting your head down and keep, you know, basically grinding it out. And I think that if you can do that, that ultimately your talents will, will come. And some guys get so frustrated by it, they just can't, or they're too lazy to put in the work. Um, but there are a lot of guys that if they keep grinding and they keep grinding and keep putting in the work, ultimately it will work out. Um, and David, I, you know, at least the story uh, of David is that he was one of those guys. Like the talent was always there. It was just took a, a while for it to come. And he, it happened to come at a time and, and maybe the getting released also was a kick for him, right? Of like, wait a minute, you know, I, I need to really do this and this. Um, but the talent was always there. I mean, if you, I, if you talk to the agents that, that represent him, always kind of believed in him. Did they know he was going to become the big poppy with ice in his veins that, you know, just came every single time during the playoffs come through? I don't think anybody knew that. I mean, I when I saw Justin Verlander pitch, I knew he was really good. I knew he had an electric arm. I know his stuff was electric. Did I know that we'd be in this situation where he's a surefire Hall of Famer? No. I mean, there's you no. You can't. You can't. Yeah. You can't. Now, that's the thing about baseball because it's so mental and because it's so psychological. Like, even the freak athlete can't miss. You still don't know what how they're going to perform under the pressure. And like you said, the slumps and the failure in baseball – is unlike any other sport. So it's not yep. like, oh, yeah, he's got it, he's done. I mean, you. there's so many, you know, think about how many Mike Trouts are there that we never heard of because of the mental side of the game. Guys right. that were just freak athlete, Bo Jackson-type athletes uh, that never got through the minors because of mental stuff. I mean, it's, that's the thing about baseball. And, like, there's no way to know, you know, someone like Big Poppy, there's no way to know that someone could have ice in their veins and, come up in the biggest moments you know over and over consistently over that his whole career with the Red Sox I've never seen anyone in my lifetime do that and uh, no. you know you certainly can't you can see talent but you can't see how talent's going to perform under high duress and high pressure on a consistent basis so yeah, yeah that's an incredible story that's yeah, an incredible story when you represent the guys the one benefit you get is that you get to kind of get in their inner circle and you get to see them, you know, when they're a little bit more vulnerable and and a little bit more honest in terms of what they're feeling. And as an agent, you get a real sense of, you know, what's in their heart, what's in their head. And and a lot of times people from the outside, maybe other than family members, don't really ever get to see that about somebody. And so don't know. And so for us, it really is a, a sneak peek. And sometimes it's like, wow, like Justin Verlander, like this guy is going to be good. He's just wired that way. You know, he has confidence in himself, but he's really, really smart. Um, and you get to figure that out. Sometimes as an agent, though, you sit across from somebody and you get the opposite feeling of like, Ooh, this guy's really struggling with confidence. They don't, they're really talented. They're a first round pick. They don't really believe in themselves. They don't know if they belong here. Um, yeah. and so you start to see both sides of it. And, um, and you know, and, and sometimes people in the front office, and other people never really get that look inside a person's heart or inside a person's brain. And so they are surprised when somebody doesn't make it um, of like, wow, I, I did not see that coming. Sometimes we have a chance to either see it coming or see the failure coming potentially because we had that, you know, we were in the inner circle. Yeah. How much of your time is spent on personal emotional psychological stuff with your clients is there is it a lot of it is it a is it consistent that you it's a part of what you have to do and players have needs they reach out to their confidants and an agent you're certainly one of their confidants yeah I, i'd say a lot especially guys that are in um, high school college and in the minor leagues that are still kind of navigating their way through it um, i think the teams have done a, a better job of surrounding them with 
team psychiatrists, team psychologists, and, you know, performance coaches or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. But a lot of times, you know, when you finish the game, it's 11 o'clock at night, you're not going to call that person. You're going to call yeah. a family member or you're going to call someone like us, right? We yeah. know we're up, they know we were watching the game and they want to get it off their chest so they can sleep. I mean, this game, it will beat you up no matter how Ooh. you are. And sometimes just be able to get it off your chest and talk about it a little bit, helps you relax, helps you calm down. And so sure. me, I can't, unlike some of my coworkers and other people in the industry, they can tell personal stories of like, yeah, this happened to me when I was in the big leagues. This happened to, you know, I can't tell the stories because I was never in the big leagues, but I can tell countless stories of my clients who lived through this and tell how you're feeling. I had this experience with this guy and here's what he did. I had this experience and here's how he was feeling and here's what we did. And so my experiences and my advice is always just based on a lot of years of experience of dealing with other guys and navigating them through it. And sometimes these guys like to know like, oh, that superstar that you represented also felt like that when he was in double A. Oh, okay. I'm not crazy. Yeah, I, I, this is okay for me to feel this way. Yeah, well, that's that's so true. It's such a good point. I could totally relate to that in my business. It's the same thing. Having decades of experience and hundreds of transaction experiences, when things that are unusual come up and some client is struggling with something, well, I can go back to here's five or ten times where someone similar had something similar, and this is how it played out. This is what we did. This is what worked and what didn't. And that's so important in every business. That's experience is so important always. No, and, uh, always. There's, and no repl- there's no replacement for experience in any business. No, and I think that's comforting to know, like when a client calls, I don't have to say, let me think about that. Let me, let me do some research on that. Let me talk to this person and that person. It's they say the problem and right away, it's like, here's what we're going to do. That feeling of confidence and experience of saying like, oh, I got this. Don't worry. I've been through this. Been through this, yeah. Kind of makes them feel like, oh, okay, he, you know, he, he's got a game plan for me. And battle tested, you're battle tested, you're experienced, yeah. you've seen it all, you've done it all, you know. And th- there's so few people in every business that really have been battle tested through the ups and downs and all arounds. There's lots of people that have success and different things, but to have that, like the wisdom and the know how and the confidence, because you've been battle tested, you've been through it, you've seen the the you know these challenges. And to be able to and I think protect for me, the client and walk them through it, it's a, it's a really yeah, special, for me, I get, thing. I, I get the advantage of, you know, navigating my own players through their careers. So I have that own, that my own personal experience to, to speak of. But, you know, we're very collaborative here. I also have the experience of helping my coworkers or my coworkers helping me of dealing with their clients and their experiences. So part of working with an established agency for 25 years is that you yeah. get see a lot a volume of problems and a volume of solutions and that's what that's your bank that you go to every time to say that's here's value. what didn't work, here's what didn't work and and that's that's invaluable totally totally let's let's talk about some fun stuff now uh, hopefully some fun stuff are we going to have a, a regular spring training i mean it's pitchers and catchers report in a few weeks what are the, what are they saying what's the baseball saying right now what are the, what, are the, what is going on in real time for fans that want to know? What are you hearing? So the game plan right now is to bring the major leaguers and then I guess typically the guys that would start the AAA season in on time. And those guys will be there. The AA and below will stay home so that it's not overcrowding at the spring training sites. And okay. major league season and the AAA season essentially will start on time. That's the game plan right now. The reason why the AAA season has to start on time is because those are the re- typically the replacements for the major league guys if someone gets injured. So you can't have down, them yeah. or have them in spring training not ready to go. Um, and then once they leave spring training, which is the end of March, the minor leaguers, so to speak, AA and below, will come in and start their spring training. So those guys will get pushed back at least a month, the minor leaguers. Everybody else is scheduled to start on time. So that's the plan. Now, of course, the plan can change at a moment's notice. What does that mean also in terms of, is it a bubble? I figure if you're going to Mesa, Arizona, and your your, your teams, what does that mean right now? Do they have protocols or or is right now they're thinking it's going to be open and normal with fans? Meaning spring training or the season? Yes, spring training, because spring training is so close. What what is Major League Baseball saying right now at this moment for spring training? I think that it will be there or no? I think it will be similar to like the season where they get tested on a daily basis. 
Um, they're going to tell people like you can't, you know, you can't go out into restaurants. You can't go hang out with people. I mean, our, we'll have limited access to our own clients. I mean, yeah. in a situation last year where I was literally across the street from one of my guys and couldn't see him because we we're following the rules and the restrictions. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. If you're trying to contain this virus, you can't you do what you can. You don't know where I've been. Like, so, yeah. um, so I think that they'll have all the same protocols, all the same testing um, that, that applied last year. And they will try to do it very much the way they did it last year. And yes, we had some issues last year with a couple teams, but I think kind of learned the hard way that if, you know, if you do follow the rules, this can work. You could, it's not easy, but you can make it work. Now the players may go nuts, not being able to go out and all that, but it's better than that than, you know, than having COVID everywhere and having the season put in jeopardy. Right. Now, it's, to me, that sounds like no fans for spring training or very limited spread out, uh, you know, few fans spread out maybe. But, you yeah, know, maybe the I, spring training is that's your opportunity for fans to get close to the players and get on the field. And the players are usually so generous and, you know, with their time and signing autographs and being close. But that's, to me, is completely in conflict with being safe with COVID. So I, I'd be curious to know how that plays out. It's, yeah, I think that's right. It's either no fans or I know I was at a couple of the independent league games and what we call is these COVID pop-up leagues that kind of get, you know popped up at various places during the regular season so that minor leaguers had a place to play. I went to a couple of those games and they did a pretty decent job. Of course, you can't go anywhere near the players, um, but they spread out the meeting and, you know, they have maybe 25% capacity and everybody had to wear a mask and, and they were able to play the games and get through seasons uh, seemingly without much of a, of an issue, unless there's issues that I just didn't know that much about. Um, but I guess it's either no, nothing, or maybe that to start off. Yeah. So who knows? And then we'll see when this, by the time uh, April comes around where we are with COVID, I guess they're, they're looking at it every day and it's a day by day situation. So yeah. it's, it's a challenge. Hopefully we'll have a full season. What are you thinking yeah, this year? What team should we look out for? My Dodgers? Go Dodgers. I mean, you look at the Dodgers roster, uh, it's impossible <laughs> to, to, to love them. But, I mean, if you see what the Padres are doing, and I know the Padres. Padres I, I, maybe, I don't know how it is, like, if it's like Chicago where White Sox fans don't like the Cubs fans and vice versa. I'm assuming the Padres fans and the Dodgers fans are in love with each other. But Yeah, it's, not really. They're not messing around. I mean, they're, they're making a run, man. They're making moves. They are legit. I yeah. mean, the – the Padres are legit. I said that last year, and I'm kind of glad it was the short season. But the Padres are very impressive top to bottom with some superstars. I mean, Tatis could be the superstar of the league. I mean, that, yeah. but that that roster is solid. It's incredible. And we, um, I mean, remember, they have Clevenger who is on the shelf, who's one of the best. Yeah. And, and he's not even guy in the equation right now with them. Right. Uh, I just had the, one of Korea's, Korea's best player come over and sign with the Padres. And we, we know when, you, when a player comes from, from overseas, they have a window of time that they have to make a decision. It's 30 days, typically. Like you either get a deal done within that 30-day window or you go back to your, your country, which is Korea, and he'll play his, his old team. So we were you know, kind of trying to figure out where he wanted to play and the Padres were one of the teams that were interested and, you know, in their Zoom calls and in their presentations to us, they were, you know, selling us on what they were going to accomplish. But at the time, we had no idea what that really meant. And we were just kind of buying into the notion that they were really going to try to make aggressive moves and try to win this year. And then we decided right before, um, a couple of days before New Year's Eve, it was, I think, the day after Christmas. And in the process of deciding and then setting up the physical and all that, it's like one trade, another trade, another signing. And it's like, whoa, they weren't messing around. By the time we signed at New yeah. Year, our New Year's Eve, it was like the whole team looked different already. And yeah, yeah. It's luck- starting to look like the Dodgers roster, like yeah. all-star all the way through. <laughs> and they're going to have all-stars coming off the bench too. So yeah. That, yeah, yeah. I think that's the model. That who's who's the Korean player? Ha Sung Kim. And what position? So he, a shortstop from Korea. But he plays short, third, and second. He, yeah. you know, go and watch his videos. This guy 
He hits for power. He hits for average. Yeah. Runs the bases. He's super athletic. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, I, he's fun. I watched a lot of the Korean Baseball League on ESPN because that's all there was for a while. Yeah. And there's some incredible players, some great hitters and pitchers. They play a really high level of professional baseball there. I was very impressed to see. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, this guy's going to come in and probably make an impact immediately. Yeah. Yeah. He'll move, he'll move and he can move around. He'll move around. That's the thing. The Padres have all these now replaceable parts where the shortstop. Can, That's important. The baseman can play third, the second baseman can play first and outfield. Like they'll move these parts around. And so yeah. you know, people can get days off, but their lineup is still going to be powerful. Yeah. So before we wrap it up, anything you want to, any advice you could give if things you knew, now that you wish you knew then, or if you were a younger uh, sports agent, if you you were giving advice to, what would you say to someone just coming up the ranks as a sports agent or someone graduating law school that wants to become a sports agent? Any advice you have for someone like that? Yeah. yeah. So some of this stuff I think is going to sound like, you know, kind of a harsh assessment of the business. But I think when you're getting into a business, a lot of times people see the the fun things, the good things, they hear some of these stories of like, oh, you did this contract for this person, you did this arbitration case, you went to the, yeah. the all-star game for this guy. Yeah. That's, great. That's the fun part of the business. But the other days are a grind. And if you can't find joy and happiness in the grind, you're not going to like it because it is extremely cutthroat. It's extremely competitive. People are always trying to steal your clients. There's like, a, I mean, anybody who saw Jerry Maguire sees there's an element of like backstabbing and you can't trust this person. And that's what this is. And a lot of people fool themselves into thinking, I like baseball. I like, you know, law. I, I could be a great sports agent. It seems really yeah. fun. And then they get in here and they get their brains beat in and they're miserable and they don't have a lot of success because it's a lot different. Those, those going to all-star games and, you know, the big end contract negotiations, those are, that's a small, small piece of the amount of time that we spend. The rest of it is going all over the place, trying to find the next Juan Pierre, going to high school games, trying to figure out whether this 16 year old projects to be a major league, you know, at least arbitration eligible player. Like it's, and you're competing against a whole bunch of other agents and there's a lot of pettiness that goes on. That is that you need to figure out exactly what this is before you get into it, because you're going to be miserable if you think it's something other than it is. If you look at Hollywood's version of this thing, you're going to be miserable. That's not what it is. Um, oh, that is such good advice, sound advice, because that is so true about so many careers, especially sports and entertainment and fashion, even real estate. I said, you know, don't watch million dollar listing and think that's what it is. It's not yeah. that, you know, it's not that at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's glamorous right. and fun and incredible, but you know, 350 days out of the year is nothing like that. <laughs> yes, exactly. And and the other thing is like you have to ask yourself, you know, am I okay as a family man being on the road? Is this a this is a very very hard on families. Um and I huge who loves being around my family. I I mean this COVID as bad as it has been, you know, it's kind of the worst thing has happened. It's forcing me to be with the the four people that I love the most in the world every single day. I'm I'm actually I'm okay with that. Like I've been totally okay. If, you know, yeah. I'm not happy of the circumstances under which I have to be in the house with my family. But those are the people I love the most. I'm okay being with them. But when things go back to normal, it's a back to a grind, traveling all over the place, and it takes its toll on your kids and it takes its toll on your wife. So you have to say if if you're going to be successful, you have to live a life on the road. Are you okay with that? If the answer is yes, and you think you can handle it, okay, then that box is checked, and maybe you can't. Um, the other thing, if you want to be in baseball and you want to separate yourself, learn a foreign language. Learn Spanish, learn Japanese, learn Korean, learn something, because that's an in into this business that a lot of people have had. There's a lot of people just like me that look like me, that act like me, that have my degrees, that want to be sports agents. Um, but you can separate yourself by being able to speak an extra language because that's where this game is going. It's already here, certainly on the Latin side, um, but that's yeah. going uh, internationally. Yeah, that, that's great advice. I, maybe I'll learn Korean and go go represent some players out there because they have a lot of good players. I've yeah. been watching on ESPN. They could rake. They could do. Man, I was I was impressed. Well, Same that's such Japan. good. Yeah, that's really good advice, and that is, uh, you know, part of the things for people to think about if you want to be a family person, if you're going to have kids, how do you balance it all? Because 
certainly your job and a lot of high profile jobs that seem so glamorous uh, and maybe they are uh, take their toll in terms of time away from home, long hours, not seeing kids, not seeing your wife or husband, et cetera. I mean, that's one of the sacrifices that you need to be okay with yeah. uh, or not okay. If you know you're not okay with it, you need to know that. Otherwise, yep. you're, you're going to end up you know, running into a wall at some point. Yeah. And if you're and if you you have to have thick skin, if you're going to get emotional um, and upset about being told no, if you're going to be upset when you you know lose a client, don't start. Don't even get into this thing, because that's what it is. No matter how good you are and how many times you're told, yes, um, it is a very, very cutthroat and competitive business. And I guess the last thing I would say is I think one of the things I've noticed in, as this thing has progressed along that there's a lot of people that are so desperate to get into the business and desperate for the players to like them that they ultimately tell the player things that they want to hear, right? You, yeah, do this. Yeah, go buy this. Yeah, go buy it. The real agents in this business are the ones that have the ability and the, and the confidence in themselves to say, no, 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 no. That's a terrible decision, man. Like, don't buy that. Don't do this. Don't say that on Twitter. And yeah. so I'm saying no to players makes it uncomfortable because you feel like, oh, they're not going to like me anymore. They're not going to want to be around me anymore. They don't want to be I'm not being like their dad. They don't want to hear that. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. If you want somebody yeah. to tell you, to tell you yes all the time, well then hire a buddy or hire your brother or something yeah. like, you, know, you can hire somebody else. But if you, if we do this right, we have to be willing to give them the advice that they need to hear. And that means putting the whole relationship at risk a lot and being willing to lose a player. Fantastic. You told him something that he didn't want to hear and he got mad and fired you. I've done it and I've lost clients and I continue to do it to this day and tell all my coworkers, that's what we're here for. We're not here to be their friends. We're here to give them advice, which is in their best interest. If they, if they get mad at you the first time you tell them no, or you tell them advice, you're going to lose them anyway. So might as well cut it off now. Tell them what they, what they need to hear and see how it goes. And if it goes well, well, you're in a good spot. You know, this is going to be a relationship that lasts for a long time. I love it. Yeah. What's well, the point of being a yes man? You're, you're supposed to protect their best interests and protect everything about their career. So, yeah, you got to give them the wisdom and the information. And if you're just going to be a yes man and yeah, yeah, go do whatever you want to do. And you know they're going to be heading for disaster. You're not doing your job. You know, right. you, like you said, you got to risk that they're upset with you. But you know what? You're doing it for them for their family and for their future and you know good clients will respect that the right yeah. client will respect that and get that and the wrong clients that you don't need to deal with it let them move on yeah if, as I, I say that all the time if, if they if they get mad at you for telling them their advice that ultimately is, is right for them they're not going to be clients that are going to last for a long time anyway um, you know ultimately you'll lose them over something else yeah Totally get it, man. That's awesome. Anything else you want to share with us today before we uh, cut it off? Or are you going to go back to uh, putting on a parka and walking around Chicago in the cold weather? Um, I'm going to be walking around Chicago. Um, I guess the only other thing, like as a general observation in the industry, is I think people sometimes think when they get into a job where their main job is negotiating, that they have to put on this kind of air and this feeling of like, I'm this hard nose. I raise my voice, I, you know, slam my fist on the table and that's how I'm going to get what I want by some level of intimidation or raising your voice. That is completely the opposite. It's, I always describe yeah. like, this is a game of chess. If you're playing chess against somebody and the person starts getting pissed off and yelling at you, do you feel like you're intimidated now? No, probably you think you got them right where you need them. Right. Yeah. So, the calm is the confidence, right? The it's is an intellect, absolutely, right? It's stay confident, stay calm, and and you know this is trying to outsmart yes. intellectually, not trying to bully them into get. You're not going to get what you want by doing that. And somehow, I think people in their first job where they're negotiating, they feel like they have to like get all emotional, something to prove, yeah, it's a sign of weakness. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I see that every day in my business. And it's yeah, it's just, it's the opposite. It has the opposite effect. If you can't yeah. stay cool and calm, and you're losing your cool and trying to bully and be aggressive. It's like ah, got gotcha, got yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's so ridiculous. It, it's not effective. It's not productive, and it's only hurting your chances of getting the best 
position possible for you or your client. But that is so well put because so many business people don't realize that, and they feel like for so they they have to put on this show and be a bully and be aggressive and yell and scream. They don't realize like ah, you're just hurting yourself. Yeah, I mean, I'll <laughs> tell you a funny yourself. story. Like, uh, uh, years ago. I was negotiating with the, uh, with kind of a, a second level um, front office person on arbitration case. And we just got stuck. Like we couldn't make any more headway. We kind of got stuck that a certain amount. And this guy told me, he's like, my boss, who happens to be the GM, is not happy about this. He's going to call you. Just be prepared for the call. I was like, well, let him call. I mean, I know who he is. Obviously, we've had you know, done business with him. Let him call. So the yeah. GM called. And just went on a tirade of f bombs and yeah, and right, and I just listened and listened and listened. I didn't really respond respond that much, and um, you know, and I said, okay, appreciate you calling, blah blah blah. I didn't get pissed off, didn't yell back, yeah. and then hung up. And later that day, the assistant called me back and he's like, so you know, what do you think? Where are you at now? And I said, we just moved our mom- number up based on that phone call. Um, yeah, <laughs> now, it's, now it's actually going to cost you more. Because that was a complete waste of my of our time, and you know you're trying. We're trying to move, move towards something that's not going to get it done. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we did. We moved our number up, and we got it uh, <laughs> that we would have, but for that phone call. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like that. That was the biggest waste of time ever. And somehow, even GMs who have been doing it for a long time still go back to that thinking yeah. and intimidate this person into getting what I want. And that's just yeah. can be farther from the truth. Yeah, if you're uh, tangling with the wrong person, it's going to blow up in your face. That's for yep. sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're if not you're doing that with somebody, peeps. <laughs> if you're dealing with somebody that has confidence and also knows that this, especially at arbitration, there there's a neutral body of people that are going to tell us who's right or wrong. You can't, yeah. right? There, there's an ultimate game plan here and a, and, a, and a way to get somebody else to decide this thing. So you can yell and scream and holler and all that. But yeah, it doesn't work. Doesn't move the needle. Well, that's awesome. We can end it on that, peep. So I appreciate you spending some time on the deal. Thanks no for problem, tuning buddy. in. We'll uh, be in touch soon. Hope to see you uh, once COVID's over. <laughs> Maybe go to a Dodger game next year. I will be out there or for Cubs. sure. <laughs> or a Cubs game. Yeah. And and are you still, for all the listeners out there, when I lived in L.A., whenever we would talk about this all the time, whenever we had an idea, like let's go to a movie or let's go, <laughs> would be... Danny, I'm down brown. Call Danny before you even ask. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Danny, you want to go? I'm in. Yeah. What are we doing? And I'm in. There aren't I'm enough in. of those people. There aren't enough of those people in the world anymore that it's just down for whatever the idea is. I'm in. I want to mix it up. I want to get after it. I'm in. I'm not sitting home. Life's too best. short, baby. Life's too short. I love it. Hey, Matt. Great. Say hi. Say my love to Dana and the kids. Hi, buddy. I'll you see too. you soon. Thanks okay. for tuning in the deal. <laughs>